Now we have reached the chapter six of the book in which we're going to talk about the graph neural networks in practice, what kinds of uh, applications they have and what kinds of optimization approaches are there to assist us in training these networks. To go over this chapter, I'm going to focus on the text of the book and we're just going to read through the text actually because there's not, there's not going to be a lot of formulas and stuff, but basically these examples and citations are actually the ones that matter the most in this chapter of the book. So this chapter is going to talk about the practical aspects of the graph neural network and the training of these networks in practice and the discussion of unsupervised pre-training. So the book mentions that the main use of graph neural networks is in three domains, node classification family of problems, graph classification, or relation prediction. To do a recap as kinds of some, some examples of these families of problems, let's read the next part. So an example of node classification is basically looking at a user in a social network and basically assigning a label of whether or not this user is a bot to it. It's going to be a node classification. Nodes are being the users and basically labeling them would be the node classification problem. Graph classification is, for example, an example of it is that you have a molecular a graph structure and you want to predict a property for, uh, for, for that entity based on the entire graph. So that's going to be a graph classification. And relation prediction, as an example, is the content recommendation in online platforms trying to figure out what product to recommend to whom, uh, what kind of uh, attributes does a product have that probably makes it uh, more interesting to some of the users, for example, in, in a website like Amazon or things like that. In terms of notation, ZU is going to be the d-dimensional vector associated with a node at the end of basically running graph neural networks on it. So it's going to be basically the final node, per, uh, node level per, uh, representation. And ZG is going to be this time a d-dimensional representation associated with the entire graph as a whole. First, let's talk about GNNs for node classification. During the earlier years of uh, graph neural networks, the main focus was on Cora, SightSeer, and PopMed citation network benchmarks. There were many challenges and things like that basically built on them. So the main task that involved these baseline datasets involved classifying the category or topic of scientific papers based on their position within a citation graph. And word vectors and language-based models could be used and was there was usually a small number of positive examples within uh, each of the classes, so less than 10% of the notes. Usually there was a negative log likelihood loss like this uh, that was used. And here is like an expanded version of that formula. Um, these terms, these four terms here are important. Supervised, semi-supervised, transductive, and inductive. So let's look at basically what this helps us distinguish between these terms in the context of training and designing graph neural networks. There are generally three types of nodes. So let's go to the first one first. You have a set of training nodes, let's call it VTrain, and these nodes are involved in the message passing that is used to train the graph neural networks. And they're also used uh, to compute the loss. In addition to those, you can have basically transductive tests meaning VTrans. These nodes are unlabeled and are not used in the loss computation. However, when you are like looking at the graph, these nodes, their incident edges and things like that are also involved in the message passing operations. This means that during the training of the network, you will generate basically representations for these nodes that belong to the VTrans set. However, uh, the final labels for these will not be used. And finally, there's an inductive test nodes in this case, the nodes are not used in loss computation or in the GNN message passing. An example is that you have an entirely different graph and you have a like, train network, train GNN used on that. So the term semi-supervised is mostly applicable where the GNN is tested on transductive test nodes. Because in this case, it has basically looked at them, it has sort of seen them, but it hasn't observed its label, their labels. And the term inductive node classification is mainly for the case of basically having test nodes in which the edges that basically help a node to take part in the message passing operation and the training operations are basically completely unobserved during the training. So it's a completely independent thing here.
Now let's talk about classifying an entire graph. My Carroll methods were popular for this. But in recent years, GNNs have also uh, been very successful in these sorts of tasks. An example being predicting molecular properties, which basically would, and for example, many of the problems would be regression problems that could be uh, dealt with with a square loss uh, on the arrow, something like that. Then they are also used for relation prediction. And the standard practice is to employ the pairwise node embedding loss functions that were basically introduced before. And then there's the context of uh, the concept of pre-training the graph neural networks. Here is an important part. Uh, here's an important part of the book. At first, it mentions that one might imagine that pre-training a GNN using one of the neighborhood reconstruction losses could be good. In other words, it says that you might think that utilizing the task, the pretext task of reconstructing neighborhood could be a good, good enough pre-training task, allowing the network to learn a lot without utilizing the labels. As an example of this, they mentioned that one could pre-train a GNN to reconstruct missing edges in a graph before fine-tuning on the node classification loss. Again, this is an example of utilizing a reconstruction loss task as a pretext task to training to pre-train the graph neural networks. However, this is not going to be good enough because it has been shown to have a very little success. There was also this article that mentioned the randomly initialized graph neural network is going to be equally strong compared to a pre-trained uh, neural network on reconstruction loss. And the, the, the hypothesis that kind of explains that is that the GNN message passing already effectively encodes neighborhood information. Therefore, the reconstruction loss is not really adding anything. In terms of what actually works, there have been positive results on basically pre other types of pre-training strategies, such as the deep graph InfoMax, that involves maximizing the mutual information between ZUs, the node embeddings, and graph embeddings. The idea is to use a discriminator and also corrupt the graph, which can be done by modifying either of the node features, adjacency matrix, or both in some stochastic manner, such as shuffling the entries of feature matrix, and then try to distinguish whether ZU comes from the, so for, for a specific node, whether or not the result actually comes from the output representation of node U in the actual graph or in the corrupted version. And basically this would be the loss that helps train pre-train the network like that. So these unsupervised strategies generally involve training GNNs to maximize the mutual information between different levels of representations or to distinguish between real and corrupted pairs of embeddings. These are often introduced as auxiliary losses during the supervised training. And in terms of the intuition, they are kind of similar to the content masking pre-training approaches that have been very successful in natural language processing and also recently in computer vision. Now let's talk about node sampling and efficiency concerns. Now one source of inefficiency here is that, for example, if multiple nodes share neighbors, we might end up doing redundant computation here. Look at the vectorized formula for the graph neural network here. The benefit of this is that there are no redundant computations. However, the limitation of this approach is that it requires operating on the entire graph. And it has to do that simultaneously, which is not going to be good due to memory limitations in, in many cases. Therefore, subsampling and mini-batching becomes a very important concept to deal with. This basically means running a node-level GNN equations as an example for on a subset of nodes in the graph in each batch. This is challenging, however, because we can't just basically run message passing on a subset of nodes and not lose information. Every time you remove a node, you also remove its edges, and you basically modify the adjacency matrix. In this page of the book, they mention several kinds of uh, articles and research works on how to overcome this. One of them is this which does this with sampling node neighbors. The basic idea is that you have a bunch of target nodes for batch, and then you recursively sample the neighbors of these nodes. And this is done to ensure the connectivity of the graph is maintained. And there are, again, some improvements on that. The next concept is parameter sharing and regularization. So we know the things such as dropout and L2 regularizations. However, some of these types of regularizations are somewhat specific to GNN setting. 
First, parameter sharing across layers is often done with gate adopted functions and GNNs with more than six layers. Then there's also the concept of edge dropout, which means you randomly remove or mask edges in the adjacency matrix with the intuition that it basically makes representations for the GNN more robust and less prone to overfit. And they have been uh, very successful in applying GNNs to knowledge graphs, and they were basically used in the original graph tension network as well.